be a very academic dis- you know, discussion, but more, uh, but more from the point of view of my experience, um, my you know, as an activist in the field uh, of sports. Um, thank you so much, Professor Devika and uh, Madhurima, for giving me this long introduction. And um, uh, thank you for mentioning Duti Chan's case there. I think um, that's where I will start, uh, you know, today because um, I believe a lot of you know Duti Chan. I'm, I'm really sort of really happy for what she has achieved till date. Um, my next slide, please, Madhurima. Thank you so much for helping me with this. So this is an image I'm using because it would have been lovely to be in Pilani and to be able to speak to you in person and meet you in person, which is something I'm not able to do. Um, and um, so I thought I'll share some images um, which can add you know, a little bit more to a very uh, boring online presentation. Um, so um, this is a picture from 2015 in front of Court of Arbitration for Sport. And you would see Duti Chant, myself, and Jim Bunting, uh, the Canadian lawyer who fought pro bono for Duti uh, at the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Jim Bunting went on to you know, represent uh, Castor Semenya later on. And um, this is a significant image. And I wanted to talk about it because Madhuri Marvin, as she first approached me to speak, she said, uh, she asked me to speak about my own experience as well as the issue that I deal with. Uh, so I would first like to say a few things about my own experience um, working with Duti and going to the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne. Um, never before in the history of uh, Indian sport did the government support an individual athlete's uh, in a pursuit to fight a ban? This was the first. And there was a lot of work that obviously went into it. Um, but also, Duti Chand was the first athlete across the world um, who challenged a sports regulations at the Court of Arbitration for for a sport. So it was quite unique at the time in 2014 at the age of 18 when Chand um, uh, decides to uh, go to the court of arbitration for a sport. Most of our athletes in India, they're unaware that there is this court um, in Lausanne, in Switzerland, where they can go if they feel that their rights are being violated by the federations or um, at whatever level the federations would be, or if they have a dispute with uh, any other body in sport. Um, so Chad got that support. Um, I was appointed the advisor come uh, mediator uh, by the government of India in her case and um, with support, with financial support uh, from the government of India. And uh, thanks to Jim Bunting who agreed to fight the case pro bono, we went to Lausanne. Now in this court, there was a long history obviously, and I'll talk about it a little more. Um, but when we were in this court, one thing that, you know, uh, that w was uh, significant and I would like to mention uh, was it was a predominantly uh, white um, court, you know, with people from glo the global north, whether it was the lawyers, whether it was the judges, whether it was um, the experts who, um, who were testifying, um, except for Duti and me. So the two of us from India representing, um, you know, the entire global south, and that kind of tells you how the sports world is, um, in general, especially international sport is. It's extremely uh, white, middle class, very European when it comes to the sport governing bodies, very American or European, I would say, um, and it was no different when we went to. The court of arbitration for sport and Duti, who couldn't speak English, was sitting there drawing images. And I, I would sort of, um, you know, explain to her a few things when we found some time, summarize what was going on at the court for four days. It was a long uh, sort of hearing, um, and uh, we had a favorable decision uh, um, in 2015, in July 2015. 
I would also like to talk about the first time when I went to meet Nithi. Um, it, it's a funny story and I have written about it. Um, it's also, it's, it's not, uh, you know, some of you may not find it, um, you know, very nice either. Uh, when I first went uh, to Duthi Chan's uh, village in 2014 to meet her for the first time, which kind of um, was, the, you know, was the beginning of our partnership, as I would say. Um, we, are, we, are, we are very closely in touch even now. Um, and um, I, had, I had a stomach bug and I needed to, needed to use the toilet and there was no toilet in the whole village. Um, and I had to finally sort of empty myself in, in the open. Um, and it was not a great, you know, it was, it, it was uh, given that I have grown up, not in luxury, but um, in urban um, middle class family, um, as we understand in India, um, we, uh, we take a lot of things for granted. And when you, and you know, in the course of my work in the last 12 years, especially as an activist in this field, I've traveled to many of the athletes' uh, athletes' villages, and you see the divide because you also go to Lausanne, you also go to see the International Olympic Committee with whom um, I have now done a little bit of work, um, and you see the difference. The food served in uh, in the in the in the restaurant in, Oli in the Olympic Museum in Lausanne, um, has a dish um, I noted, um, which cost forty three European. You know that's the euro, euros, so that's kind of the basic dish, and that would be Duthi Chan's parents' monthly income if you convert it to Indian rupees. So that's the difference. That's the gap we are dealing with. So what we did in 2014-2015 when Duthi Chan was banned was huge. We were causing disruptions which were never caused before. Um, we didn't understand that then, but we did even I already talked about the Chan's case 2014. We appealed the IAAF policy to Court of Arbitration for Sport. It's a policy that said women with a certain level of testosterone uh, hormone um, cannot compete in a the women's category in sport. We challenged it in 2014, we, uh, 2015 we had a hearing and eventually um, the policy was suspended. Between 2015 and 2017 there were no sex testing in decades um, and uh, there were no eligibility regulations at the Rio Olympics, um, which is when a lot of especially in, in, the, in the UK, the BBC for example, um, uh, did speak a lot about uh, the podium, who's making it to the podium in 800 meters. And some of you may be aware of Castro Sabania. Um, um, and uh, we, we would see as I go to my next slide, uh, uh, I'll talk about Castro's case a little bit. I was talking, I, I think my next image would be an image of uh, uh, me and uh, Castro Sabania, the world champion in 800 meters and Olympic champion at Rio Olympics as well as at London Olympics. And one of uh, her, her um, lawyers, uh, Greg Knott, uh, Greg Knott is from South Africa who has closely worked with Castor Semenya in the last, uh, you know. So the IWF proposes DSG regulations and Semenya challenges. In 2017, IWF goes back to court after Duthi Chand with fresh scientific evidence, no evidence for print events. So Ms. Chand allowed to run freely and they come up with a new regulation called DSG regulations, which only impacted a few events in athletics and one mile um, in 2018. And Castro Semeni appeals against that. In 2019, in a majority decision, Court of Arbitration for Sport upholds the DSG regulation. So Castor um, did not succeed, and unlike Duthi, who is not with that case, her case, Castor wasn't able to win her case. Um, Sibania then appeals at the Swiss Federal Tribunal unsuccessfully, and now uh, she has uh, decided to move to the European Court of Human Rights. Can we go to the next slide, uh, Madhurima? 
Uh, so I'm next going to talk about this other athlete I have worked with, um, Anat Nagesa, um, and um, and her fight back in 2019. She's an Ugandan athlete who was um, who was very unfairly treated uh, by the International Association for Athletics Federations on the basis of th these regulations that I work on. Um, and I will talk about her story later uh, in, a, in a, a little more detail, but I'll move on to my next slide so that I can um, start talking about uh, the issue in general. So I'm quoting uh, your founder. We want to teach real science, whether it is engineering, chemistry, humanities, physics, or any other branch. We want to develop a scientific approach in Pilani, which means there would be no dogma. Uh, there will be a search for truth. And I felt this is a very apt quote that I can use because the work I essentially do is about athletes' rights, but it is also about um, uh, about science. Because when you think about uh, sports and the, in the history of sex testing policies, it has been governed by what is looked at as medical science and there have been uh, medical commissions in the international olympic committee or at, in the international association for athletics federations or other federations of sport um, who have decided whether or not to have regulations so here we are dealing with a subject which was long looked in a sort of uh, dealt with by medical uh, people, whether, you know, scientists or medical practitioners, and it was looked at as a medical issue. When I started working on this issue, and I started sort of conversing with women's sports groups and women's sports organizations in the West, um, in the UK, or in the, in, even in the US, uh, I, re I felt that there will, would always be a reaction that this is a medical issue, this is not a feminist issue. So um, that was the kind of uh, discussion, that, that was the kind of barrier that I faced when I tried to say, no, it's a feminist issue, it's a human rights issue. Um, and, um, and this is why this particular quote, uh, which I felt would be interesting um, here, especially I'm hoping some students are listening to me, um, uh, the, the use of the word dogma um, is quite interesting, and it's not only interesting in the um, in case of the work that I do or I'm talking about today, but it's also interesting in the in, in the current state of affairs that we live in today. Um, uh, uh, you know the um, the the emphasis on scientific approach um, uh, is quite less, and um, and we also need to question another thing um, here is the science that we talk about often, whether that science is neutral. And that is one of the things that I'm going to talk about um, in my next slide. Madhrima, I thank you. Um, that was very quick. Uh, sex testing policies in sport. Uh, so 1966, sex testing was introduced in European track and field championships in Budapest. Uh, initially routine genital examination Later, slightly more sophisticated ways of testing uh, from 2000 Sydney Olympics, routine sex testing. So there used to be uh, kind of, you know, initially physical examination, then there were slightly more sophisticated ways. And it was for, meant for all women who were competing. And there was a lot of protest against that. And so in 2000 Sydney Olympics, they stopped routine sex testing and they introduced case specific if there is a complaint they would then make a make an investigation that's what they began from 2000 in olympics uh, stockholm consensus came in 2003 i'm not going to make any detail of that um it's not uh, so important and then indian athlete chanthi sandarajan from tamil nadu um, you may have heard of her in 2006 asian games in doha um, she won a silver medal and then, then she was investigated and her medal was taken away and it was very shortly handled. So it was, you know, in the media. Um, I have worked with Shanti Sandrajan later, but not in 2006 as much. Next slide, please. How much time do I have? Do I have about 10 minutes? Or a little more? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. As much as you want, yeah. Um, 
so uh, can we can i um, yes so here is a, a, an image from 2009 when castro semenya uh, became the world champion and her controversy because a few years after shanti sandarajan's case came to um, uh, came to you know became popular that in 2009 you would um, uh, see castro semenya um being investigated and that news is leaked and um this is a this is how the british press um sort of um, represented her story boy that some men golden girl to face sex test and i would see it was 2009 was also sen bolts year and they they are kind of celebrating uh when you know usain bolts victory in a different way than how they they were reporting about um castus menus victory but there has been some work in that decade and thanks to that you see and these two amazing athletes duti chand and castus menia and now anat negas has fight back as well um we see there is a shift this kind of a um shift in the scrutiny earlier it was women's bodies which were being scrutinized that's the kind of reporting you would see on the left and on the right you would see how it's reported today Castro Semenya says IWF used her as a guinea pig, human guinea pig, and fears others at risk. So, it's suddenly the scrutiny has been reversed, and the IWF, the Institute, the um, International Association for Athletics Federations, which has now changed its name to World Athletics, um, they are um, asked to be more accountable. Next slide, please. a uh, history of ignorance um uh, is something that professor aini longfist the chairperson of um, international olympic committee's medical commission he was the chairperson for about i think he was a member of the medical commission for 25 years and chairperson for a long time too aini longfist uh, during the tichan's case while testifying said the history of sex testing policies is a history of ignorance um it's a very unique thing to say and why did he say that and it takes me back to the idea of signs that i was talking about as a medical commission chairperson of the ioc he accepted that every time they came up with a policy that regulates women's bodies mainly from the global south in a few years time they realized it was inadequate so they had to come up with something else so they have this whole history of creating policies on um you know on on uh, who can be defined as a woman in sport um is a history of ignorance according to one of the people who was part of this history and uh, one of the people who was making these policies um so this science is inadequate um in recent times especially with the dsg regulations which we are still fighting um Uh, and castles many are was challenging the iwf study the research that they are talking about we can say it's a scientific research there is science to you know support the dst regulations but that science um is contested there are hundreds of errors that were found um that that, that you know some scholars have found with from that study and also it is it is very it is noteworthy that the study was conducted by scientists who were commissioned and paid by the iwf so is that science necessarily neutral or is that science behind these regulations which regulate women's bodies from the global south are um are manipulated by the people who want to have these regulations the study does not prove causation and uh, it does not say that a certain level of naturally occurring testosterone in a woman woman's athlete will give a certain level of advantage it doesn't say that it talks about some kind of correlation so it's not, correlation studies are not always um, best especially when a lot is at stake there are several such arguments which can be made about the scientific evidence but i'm not going into that detail um next slide please madhuram thank you and you you know when you talk about sex testing policies the other kind of point that is often 
many of you may have come across, and I get that question a lot, is about level playing field, uh, the illusory level playing field. Um, why do I say it's illusory? Um, again, I'm quoting some medical condition people themselves here uh, to justify my argument. We need to st stress that though some may provide competitive advantage in case of high testosterone, fundamentally it is no different than the advantage other athletes have because of their genetically endowed height or fast to slow twitch muscle ratio or the misfortune of having a genetic disorder such as Marfan syndrome which gives you long you know, sort of fingers and tools. Um, so that's something that Myron Janelle and Annie Longfus said. Um, as far as the idea of fair sporting co competition is concerned, Thomas Murray, who, who was part of their ethics committee, the IAAF ethics committee, said, um, a fair sport competition does not require that athletes be equal in every imaginable respect. And that is, that is quite impossible and we are we who are who are against these regulations we don't really ask for that because if you think about it if you think about resources economic resources of athletes in our countries like our country you know like in india uh, it's not comparable to one of the european um you know countries for example the uk where they spend a lot of money on each of the olympian athletes next slide please Uh, now, important uh, fact about Cass' decision on Semenya's case, Semenya's case that we have lost, um, Cass in a majority decision upheld the regulations in 2019 and Swiss Federal Tribunal upheld the Court of Arbitration for Sport decision in 2020. It was a majority decision, so two is to one. The third and dissenting judge's arguments and opinion does not appear in the Court of Arbitration for Sport decision and were not considered by the Swiss Federal Tribunal. So even though we have an international court of sport where disputes can be you know, sort of heard and resolved, whether this court is independent and what is how, how is this court coming to a decision? And if you look at that, these are the three judges, and I'm using these images of the medical commission people and uh, the judges intentionally because you all you always see is the pic is the photos of athletes. You don't see these people, but you know uh, their faces and their bodies are never in you know under scrutiny. So I just thought that it would be lovely to use um, the images. And if you see uh, these three uh, judges who were part of the panel. And you probably know who is the dissenting judge. I'm not going into that. Um, but it's important to note that the dissenting judge who did not agree with the majority decision, um, his or her opinion wasn't made, you know, wasn't reported in the judgment at all. And that needs to be uh, pointed out. It's unfair that one out of three judge did not accept the decision in Castasimania case. Um, and that was never, that we never come to know what he or she was talking about. Uh, can we uh, move to the next slide, Madhurama? Um, so I think one line has, uh, I, I don't see it in my, uh, so it's basically between 2011 and 2014 when the hyperandrogenism regulations, which our athlete Duti Chand had challenged in 2014. Um, what was going on? Uh, what these sport governing bodies were doing? What International Association for Athletics Federations was doing? In World Championship in Daegu uh, in 2011, blood samples were taken from all athletes. These, uh, you know, this also sort of led to witch hunt of women athletes with testosterone. So what is happening here is uh, blood samples are taken for doping reason, but the same blood samples also give you an idea about how high your testosterone levels are. I'm not going to explain it in detail, but that kind of led to a witch hunt because the federations had information about the testosterone levels of these women, even if they were naturally occurring testosterone, and they tried to reach out to these women and stop them from competing. 
IWF scientists published a paper about investigating and conducting invasive and irreversible surgeries on four young women, athletes from rural or mountainous regions of developing countries. Surgery is not for health risk, but to level the playing field. Um, athletes began to disappear from the circuit unnoticed. Now, this particular 2013 study is extremely important because, because here they are saying that they conducted surgeries um, in order to reduce testosterone levels in order to ensure that these women are able to compete in the women's category. So here you are asking women to undergo surgery just because they wanted to compete in sport, not because they have a health risk. And that is crucial. Um, it was um, this obviously sort of some ethicists started raising this question. And uh, it was in 2013 that this paper was published. And it was a paper that we kind of, uh, during the, the chance case, we had to depend a lot. And, uh, um, and it's very interesting that the paper talk about four young women who come from rural or mountainous regions of the developing world. Uh, so that clearly tells you the global south and global north divide in international sport and how women's bodies from the global south are targeted or how women athletes from the global south are treated by these federations, not really as humans. Um, next slide, please. So I was... I show you a picture of me and Anit Negisa, the Ugandan athlete. Um, uh, Anit Negisa, in 2011, um, ran in world championships, um, did not go to the finals, um, and was looking forward to competing in London 2012 in 2012. Um, and at that time, she's asked to undergo a test, and then she disappears between 2012 and 2019. In 2019, uh, I got through to her. Somehow I was able to connect with Annette through another athlete I knew who knew her. And um, that's when she was working in, a, you know, in, in interior Uganda. She didn't really have much, you know, she was, there's an image here you see, they're trying to uh, build a cow shed. Um, so what happens in 2012 that forces her to disappear? She was investigated in a hospital in France that was conducted by doctors associated to the RAAF. And then uh, following that, um, the, she, was con she, con she, she underwent a surgery in, U in a Ugandan hospital where the National Federation and the International Federation actually were directly in contact with the doctors in that hospital. And um, she is, um, this surgery was done without informed consent. She says that she wasn't aware that it was a surgery. She thought it was an injection. And that after our surgery, which was a gonadectomy, she would require hormone replacement therapy. She would require estrogen for the health of her bones for her entire life. This information was not given to her. So for uh, from 2012 to 2019, uh, she's unable to come back. She's never back in the circuit. And if you are an athlete and not in the circuit, no federations care for you. You are a disappeared athlete. That's why I have that image of disappeared there. Um, and this is what happened to Annette, but I fear there are several other athletes who, who went through it and I have not been, or me or anyone else, have not been able to reach them. An ARD documentary, a uh, German ARD documentary in 2019, uh, is where Annette talks about her story. Um, and there's a story of another athlete who went through a similar situation, but um, she... Uh, you know, she doesn't really openly talk about it, so we don't know who she is. Um, and then because she was in Uganda, she didn't feel safe being there after coming out as a woman with a variation, intersex variation. She wanted to move out of Uganda, and she's now got an asylum in Germany and living in Berlin. In the last image, you could see that. Um, that's Annette's story. And this is what the IAAF, the Sport Governing Body of Athletics, has been doing is this then their duty of care can i go to the 
नेक्स्ट स्लाइड मधुरिमा So here is a uh, the first lines are not visible is the World Medical Association which have openly taken a stance against these regulations in international sport, advising medical physicians not to conduct these invasive surgeries which are not uh, which are just meant uh, so that uh, these athletes are able to compete and obviously these athletes are not left with much of a choice at that point when they are told that you can compete only if you're undergoing such medical intervention next slide um the un has the un high commissioner uh, has um, you know he highlighted the discrimination and harm faced by women and girls in sport and the, specifically women with dsd dsd um is what uh, Uh, differences of sex development is what the IWF uses in its regulations. We also say women with variations of sex characteristics, or women with sex variations. Um, next slide. And I was, as I questioned already, uh, the IWF, uh, the World Athletics, is um, in a press release boasts about their care and compassion. But where is the care and compassion when you? forcing young women athletes to undergo surgery to be able to compete in sport not telling them what they need for their health for their bone health for their entire life um and um, you are just sort of you know these athletes are disappearing and there is no nothing that the federations have been doing um because they feel that these regulations are important because um they are in because they want to make the field a level playing field but it's never level and what you see here is the iwf being only concerned about the podium who's winning is more important than the lives of women with variations of sex characteristics from the global south because almost all of these women impacted by these regulations are from the global south next uh and this is what iwf says um in in another press release the iwf is not a public authority exercising state powers but rather a private body exercising private contractual powers therefore it is not subject to human rights instruments such as the universal declaration of human rights or the european convention of human rights so sport the moment you enter sport what they are trying to say you you are not in a human rights it doesn't matter you're an athlete and that's all that's your identity but an athlete also has human rights that's the kind of position that we are pushing for at this point uh, can we go to next slide but causing disruptions matter and um, i have a quote here from arunthati roy um and i i believe professor devika you 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 are very fond of uh, uh, Arundhati Roy's um, uh, fiction. I I I I heard that you you did uh, you know write about uh, Roy's uh, 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 novels. Um, this is from one of um, her nonfiction um, uh, pieces. What we need to search for and find, what we need to hone and perfect into a magnificent, uh, sorry, this spelling mistake, a uh, shining thing is a new kind of politics, not the politics of governance, but the politics of resistance, the politics of opposition, the politics of forcing and accountability, the politics of slowing things down, the politics of joining hands across the world and preventing certain destruction. in the present circumstances i would say the only thing worth globalizing is dissent it's india's best export i can write like arunthati roy and therefore i wanted to quote her directly uh when when i was talking about the story of me visiting duti chand's village i have been or gone back to her village later but the first time when i went there my mother was with me because i was ill um and i was talking about defecating in the open and uh, that's what the situation had been in india for a long time um uh, and recent efforts where the government especially the swachh bharat movement i believe um uh, is trying to sort of change that 
but i have also heard stories of um you know how women uh, have been chased harassed photographs have been taken of them after this particular um you know uh, after, after you know by government local government uh, officials um in recent times um because of this particular swachh bharat uh, movement and it's like they were contaminating um uh in a contaminating um the you know, the india that we have and uh, it's interesting and i think i would end in, uh, in there that when um you know that very you know same athlete i worked with and um, the story that i was talking to you about uh, duthi chand came out as india's first gay athlete a couple of years back and it caused again a different kind of disruption and i think these disruptions are very important whether it be at the court of arbitration for sport where two brown women in a predominantly white room that i was talking about in 2014 um we were causing disruptions there um whether it is miss chand talking about her sexuality openly in india um especially in sports which is quite traditional uh, as sector in india um she caused disruptions there and these disruptions do matter this is the politics of resistance probably what arundhati roy is talking about and it does change uh, things and we have seen the change was talking about how things have changed in the last 10 11 12 years because of that leads um activism especially on this particular issue and um, because i'm hoping some students are listening to me i would hope that um you know you will value the idea of causing disruptions rather than uncritically following uh, rules and regulations which are thrust on us thank you Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Poishni Mitra, for that wonderful, enlightening, and such an inspiring talk. Um, the floor is now open uh, for questions uh, from participants. Uh, please feel free to ask questions to Dr. Poishni Mitra. I'm sure she'll invite us even more there. Thank you. Thank you, Madhuri. Absolutely. Uh, thank you dr mitra it was a very insightful talk and uh, to begin with i have a not exactly a question but a curiosity when you are talking about that the when you visited the village of duthi chand so the kind of the is it the treatment that is meted out to all the athletes across the globe when we talk about the social or economic uh, constraints or in india we have a different kind of situation in comparison to the other global aspects i i wouldn't say it's only in india the economic situation that i referred to when i uh, went to duthi's village um is uh, not uh, uh, not the same for all athletes in india um in the in track and field most women athletes even male athletes come from really ordinary circumstances and that's what i have seen but there are um, there are about uh, seven or eight countries in africa that i uh, work with you know i work with athletes in seven or eight, eight countries in africa uh, at this point and i don't see a very different picture there um however i'm living in england now and obviously you know it's 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 a different story here um there there is always a diversity um but the difference of you know when it comes to what resources you have is so vast when it, when we are talking about countries like ours in the global south and those more advanced sporting nations of the global north it's quite stark um so that will be my answer to your question thank you thank you mitra uh 
Uh, others may please ask the questions. And we uh, we have a senior most faculty, Professor Sangeeta Sharma. She is, I think, uh, sort of an athlete among all of us. So, Sangeeta, over to you. Hello. Ah, uh, thank you very much. It was indeed wonderful to listen to you and know about the problems faced by women athletes. Ah. Uh, Fortunately, we never face any problem in this place, so I now find uh, myself more lucky than before. Uh, uh, it was indeed a pleasure to listen to you. I don't have any questions, but I have a small question: Are you also into sports? I Or have, yeah, what I, what all you do? I have played badminton. Uh, oh, okay. Myself uh, up to the universe, I have represented my university, and I uh, have coached uh, also. Uh, I'm an I'm an UKCC level two coach uh, in in badminton. So, but I don't coach right now. But I was coaching a few years back. Um, so I'm a. um qualified coach yes yes so i i feel once you are in sports you can understand the problems faced by the sports women better uh, than otherwise and uh, that is why i felt that you know uh, a, every anecdote every story which you told was so meaningful and uh, i can understand the kind of turmoil you must have gone through when you were listening to the stories and you know helping out these uh, women players uh to get out of the trauma they had been facing thank you very much thank you um thank you dr sharma um i um, i really appreciate your feedback and the kind words you said uh i think um, i'll just take this opportunity to add something um i haven't spoken about um and that's the story of me coming to sports i i was first sent to a a dance school you know in in calcutta growing up many of young girls would be sent to dance dance schools when they are children for physical activity and mm -hmm. so i and there was an incident where my dance teacher's um, husband um, you know tried to sexually abuse me and uh, i decided not to uh, not to go back to that school ever again i didn't talk about it to anyone but i decided oh join uh, i felt that sport would give me a kind of a safe um you know space where um i will um i will not face something like this and that's when i asked my parents that if i could play sport so the reason why i came to sport was in search of safety uh, rather than uh, for the reason that i loved sport i do love sports um and if i had not loved sports i wouldn't have worked so hard to clean it or to make mm -hmm. it better for many athletes That's but right. at that time i came into sports in search of a safe space but what i experienced in sports myself and through these athletes tells me that sport is not safe either and we have mm -hmm. a lot to do mm -hmm. okay. quite right quite right thank you so much thank you Dr. Mitra, I I have a quick question. Uh, so, uh, with you know, on the topic of diversity and this divide between global north and global south, um, and you worked uh, in in various countries of the global south, whether it's India or in you know countries in Africa, uh, even within the context of global south, uh, what is the element of diversity? I mean, what have been the differential experiences of while you worked on these you know gender related issues? um in indian context as opposed to a country in africa so even within the global south what is the aspect of diversity uh, or the element of difference uh, because we we tend to you know divide between the global south and global north but even in the context of global south it's very diverse uh, and intersectional so uh, what has been your personal experiences there and uh, how how do you address that diversity or difference uh, if you could thank you um, dr das a uh, thing is uh, you know you you asked me a question that would require another hour of presentation um <laughs> i don't think we can afford to do that um but um it's you know there are obviously i mean i completely agree with you that it would be generalizing if i just say it, 
that it you know the experiences of all athletes across nations are the same it is not it is dependent on several things it dependent on the specific federations uh, even within one country often how your experiences are i mean for example in india bcci bcci for the amount of funding that they have um, are able to uh, do much more than most other federations uh even within india uh, ms chand got a lot of support from the orissa government which was in the case in other parts of india so we have you know in every every way there are lots of diversities um uh, within uh, you know for example um in kenya um athletes i mean if, if you think about how duti chand was supported um a lot of other indian athletes who came before her told me that uh, you didn't do this or you know we didn't get this support um so um i hear that from a lot of athletes from in the african region as well um that we never knew that there was a court existed we didn't get the same support as duti chand got and at negesa in 2012 didn't have the support that miss chand had and also if you think about it miss chand could and even though we complain about the situation in india there is the presence of of a civil society there is some kind of support which allowed her which kind of helped her come out um she found that strength and courage to talk about her sexuality in 2019 which isn't easy for for example and at negesa um in you know uh, in uganda because of the state of affairs there and how difficult it is for anyone belonging to the queer community anyone who identifies in, in, as a sex or even you know the larger lgbtiq community there it's so difficult that she had to move out of uganda after she talked about it openly uh, so obviously there were all these different layers we can keep talking about it south africa um uh, mr mania was much supported you know by by the government throughout um even though you know it's a long story it's not a linear story but mostly uh, she has been very well supported in south africa but you won't see that in another part of the con- of the continent for example not so much i mean margaret wampwe in kenya is not so much supported doesn't feel supported by the athletics community in kenya margaret wampwe for those of you uh, who may not know um, came third in rio olympics in 800 meters uh, behind castor and francine on sab of burundi and uh, has been banned from competing in 800 meters due to the same regulations Thank you so much. Uh, there are a, a few notes of appreciation in the chat box, uh, so I'll just read it out. Uh, Dr. Anupam, you are my colleague. Uh, she says, "Very interesting talk. Thank you." Um, Dr. Kumar Shankar Bhattacharya says, "It was wonderful. Much thanks." Um, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. One. Hello. Yeah, Supriya. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Uh, it was very interesting to know such hidden facts about sports field uh, so my question is that uh, does gender diversity among the board members of these athletic federation have an impact on the policies being given out um the very interesting question uh, supriya uh, yes, thank you um um it's 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 been a hard um, battle for women sports feminists across the world to sort of find that balance within the uh, within the administration it's still not there i mean if you think about it tokyo is most or paris is probably going to be 50% 50% of athletes from both sexes for the first time so it's only now that we are getting to that level when it comes to at- athletes um it's a much harder a uh, struggle for women coaches and women officials um whether there is uh, you know gender parity in rep- you know whether there are enough number of women representatives in the boards no um many of these organizations are working towards it now when you are talking about women representatives does it necessarily change no 
does it necessarily change the perspectives i would say no because also you know if you think about if i talk about the particular work that i do you know they had the iwf and the ioc had involved women uh, athletes um before they have involved one trans athlete uh, joanna harper and um, yeah, she's from the us um they had involved spanish athlete maria but you know we who also went through a very uh you know a, a, a lot of public scrutiny at some point for being uh, for having a particular variation um but from spain so again i think uh, there is an increasing number of women who are being involved in decision making bodies committees boards at this point but you would see very few women from the global south and uh, we cannot ignore that these voices are very diverse voices uh, women don't have a single voice and to be fair in recent conversations for example i was in an international association for um, press journalists uh, conference recently where i got a lot of reaction from some sport feminists uh, from on in the us um because there is a huge divide about among uh, some you know uh, women in sport about this idea of how to define the category of women whether to include women with variations of sex characteristics like catastasomania or also the question of inclusion of trans women um is huge in the us so i i'm already often at the receiving end of a lot of anger from several women um 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 who feel a uh, very strongly um, against uh, inclusion of um you know women with high level of testosterone or trans uh, women but um, i i try to tell them that you cannot conflate the two issues trans women's issues is different from the women i work with who have variations of sex characteristics who were assigned female sex at birth and were brought up as women um, and have always identified as women um and uh, most of the vocal trans women athletes at this point are from the global north and um and most of them are not in in in, in high performance sport as opposed to the women athletes with high testosterone like Esther Semenya who's or Margaret Wambui who are at the top level of sport so so there is also you know it, it i i don't think it's going to be any easy for the very specific issue that i work on uh, if there are more women representatives um and women are often also voicing um you know region specific issues um, there is no sort of uh, so it's 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 a complex it's a very complex uh, issue and i don't think it's going to necessarily solve the problem uh if there are more women in the board but there should be more women in the board okay ma'am thank you um paul did you have a question or because i saw you on mute or Hi. thank you okay okay i just had one question uh thank you so much for the talk uh this is so uh very interesting one what i found uh quite insightful was that part where you were talking about uh, how a lot of these uh, institutions claim that they are private entities at the moment when they are being brought uh, to be held responsible for for the very obvious social concerns and social concerns where any society should legitimately have a claim on uh, institutions that are part of it or making decisions on behalf of it so here uh, what Uh, really made me think of was about corporate law and certain privileges that are sort allotted to you know entities that claim to be private and that claim as private is often sanctified through law as well uh, if so for instance if you're a company if you're registered with a company then you get certain protection which uh, means that you are as an individual uh, are, is not held accountable for the liability that the company <laughs> would have and things like that so uh, i was immediately thinking that uh, wondering whether uh, 
you think that this extreme concentration of economic power is also one way in which uh, private entities, by claiming to be private entities that are playing a different set of rules, uh, cannot be now held accountable for human rights violations or in fact appearing from war or any other kind of uh, in fact, a lot of technology companies are now going through the same kind of question of accountability. Australia is having battle uh, with Google and Facebook uh, over whether the state can dictate certain elements of their policy and so on. So I was wondering if you thought this uh, is a major problem that you face in your line of work, especially in your activism uh, for uh, whether it is athletes or any of um. I, I cannot talk about the broader picture, picture that you talked about, but yes, um, uh, I think uh, what I did not uh, really spell out was the idea of autonomy of sport, uh, which impacts, um, you know, uh, impacts human rights issues in sport. Um, because what you what you have seen in that particular slide um, that I shared about the IWF position. Uh, saying that we are a private contractual uh, body, or we are a private uh, body with contractual powers, um, is is basically saying that we are a sport governing body, and uh, issues like these are uh, sport issues, and human rights principles um, shouldn't come into sport. So they are. Tr trying to draw a line and, and talk about sports autonomy. Now, if you look at the history of, for example, the Indian Olympic Association, the battle between Indian Olympic Association and the Ministry of, uh, in the Department of Sport, uh, the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports in India, you see this battle has been there for a long time about who has, uh, you know, whether the government can intervene into what the IOA have been doing. And this is the same internationally. Um, sports autonomy is, according to people like us, uh, activists who are trying to make, um, you know, trying to make a case for athletes' rights. Uh, you know, for us, we feel that sports autonomy is a big problem. It's, it's the biggest problem because even if governments have human rights principles, often they're unable to intervene because sport has this whole sort of you know, regulations of their own. When we approached Athletics Federation of India in Duthi Chan's case, for example, the reaction I got from uh, the Athletics Federation of India was that we, um, in, 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 uh, we are bound by the regulations of the International Association for Athletics Federations. Now, I had at that time a choice to go to the High Court in Delhi uh, to fight this. I chose to go to the Court of Arbitration for Sport because that was the advice I was getting from also the international experts who were in, I was working with at that time. But after a few, I mean, it's it, after a few years of work, now we feel that the Court of Arbitration for Sport, which deals with sport disputes, is incapable of addressing human rights issues in sport. And therefore, Castor Semenya is finally moving to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but for that, Castor had to ensure that she has used all possible other avenues that she had. Otherwise, a case wouldn't be heard uh, at the Court of um, Europe, at the European Court of Human Rights. So. Um, I, I kind of, you know, I, I, I think there is a parallel, of course, to all the other industries that you were talking about. But in sports, it's a huge problem. Um, uh, and what as, as, you know, as activists, we are now trying to do is make sure that these international sport bodies um, adopt a human rights framework. And as part of it, um, we can sort of address these kind of athletes' rights issues that I talked about today. I think that could be one way of addressing uh, similar problems in other industries. Thank you so much, Dr. Mito. Uh, yeah, I, I think, as you said, it's very clear that justice delay is also in a sense of the United I wasn't able to hear properly. 
uh, uh, just thanking you and uh, saying that uh, what you say is also in terms of delay. This is a long process that is in delays justice, which then denies justice in a way. Yes, it's a long process. In when when we you. you know when people like you know when we call us as activists and when we work, we say we are we know that we are writing. We are, we might not be able to see the change that we are working to. So, but that's how it is. Um. Dr. Sumita, you have another question? So I actually have just a curiosity. Uh, uh, I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Payoshni, for an ex excellent, a very fascinating talk. Well, I just have a curiosity, and, and you could possibly uh, you know, give me an answer to this. When you talk about going to the arbitration court and you talk about experts and their evidence that you also said at one point that science is contested. So when the, and when the science is contested, uh, did you notice how that arbitration court then negotiates these different versions of evidence that may be presented in the court? Uh, can you throw some light on that? How is that done? And what, what was uh, the issue, if you ever figured out, how is then, uh, how are these different versions of, of evidence or, or any kind of, uh, that these experts put out and are contesting with each other, how are they negotiated? Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Raina. Uh, I so uh, wished that this was in person, really. Uh, it would be so much better. Um, uh, again, a very complex question. Um, as part of, you know, both the cases uh, that I, you know, Castro Semenya's case as well as uh, Duti Chan's case, both, both probably longest uh, discussed in a long in the hearing where in Duti Chan's case were four days in the hearing in Castor's Emmanuel's case was five days um, and um, in Duti Chan's case the decision was um, according you know the decision was slightly more about um, the the inadequacy of the science um, it, it, the decision did point to the inadequacy of the science. It did say it's unfair. Um, ethically, it was unfair. So it kind of, um, even though finally the judgment was given on the basis of the fact that the scientific evidence that the IAAF provided wasn't enough, it somehow was a victory for the ethical issues that we were raising. When it came to Castor Semenya's case, which we actually lost, um, it was slightly different. On one hand, I would say uh, there was a one positive. For example, you know, the, among the experts, I I I, did, I testified in Duti Chan's case as a witness, but I testified in Castro Semenya's case as an expert, um, and that's interesting because when it came to Castro Semenya's case, uh, someone like me. Uh, who's, who's experienced in working with athletes, was considered an expert, and my voice was among the experts' testimonies. So there was a slight change there. On the other, the discussion, if you look at the judgment in Semenya case, you will notice it's extremely medical. So I did feel we went a step back with Gaston's case, discussing this issue from a completely medical point of view. And then again, of course, I pointed out there were several questions raised about the resource that the IAAF produced um, and the arguments they made and uh, the data that they used, whether they had permission to use those data of athletes for this purpose, because those samples were collected mostly for doping purposes. Uh, so all kinds of questions were raised about um, their um, you know, arguments and their uh, evidence. Uh, but I did feel that Castro Semenya's case was a step back uh, from what we had in 2015 in Duthi Chan's case. Um, and that's why the need to move to European Court of Human Rights now and Greg Nott, you saw a picture I showed him initially, um, has uh, spoken to the media towards the end of 2020 um, saying that Castor is um, going to the European 
Court of Human Rights, finally. Um, there are only very few cases from Court of Arbitration Court that have gone to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but it's, it's, it's a long stand. It, 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 this battle has been on for some time. And um, a lot of people are actually trying to ensure that sport is safer, sport is inclusive, and sport is... Um, is paying, you know, the sport includes these human rights principles. Interestingly, the IOC and FIFA, the biggest sport organizations in the world, have signed human rights, um, you know, declarations. So it will be interesting. And um, in, on, in December uh, 2020, the IOC published um, a document um, which is a recommendation for an IOC human rights strategy and um, so we, we are hopeful that slowly there is a movement towards inclusion of human rights in sport but yes um, I kind of um, agree that till date till date this whole discussion on, on how to define the women's category has been extremely medical um, it's only recently that we have been asking questions about the credibility of the science. Thank you very much. You have answered me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for asking such uh, uh, complex questions. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, so... Thank you so much, Dr. Mitra, for coming today, taking the time out. Um, and I think your body of work, your activism, your contribution, um, not just you know, within the domain of gender and sports, but also in the, in the larger understanding and how you use gender and sports to address other master statuses and identity, uh, whether it's about race, religion, nationality, uh, sexuality, uh, which is just so fascinating. Um, and, you know, thanks, thanks so much uh, for coming over uh, and thank you to all the participants uh, for, for their enthusiastic uh, participation and questions. And thank you to Professor uh, Devika, who have always, you know, supported such missions. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, we, we look forward to having Dr. Mitro on campus sometime uh, when things are sane and normal uh, and we can have a, an even more you know, enthusiastic conversation uh, in a non-virtual platform. But I'm glad we could at least because of the virtual uh, presence and you know, uh, the, the kind of reality that we are existing in. Hopefully sometime soon this will end and uh, we get to meet uh, each other uh, you know, in, in normal circumstances uh, and you know, discuss much more about such complex and important and timely issues. Um, Professor Devika, do you want to say something? Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Madhrima, for organizing the lecture. And thank you, Dr. Okay. Mitra, for accepting our invitation to be a part of our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much for having and, me uh, for this wonderful discussion. It, was yeah. really, mm -hmm. you know, it, it really helps when you are asking complex questions. And so um, I really appreciate that. And I can't thank um, Dr. Das enough uh, for giving me this opportunity. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure, absolutely. Um, the, the talk of, uh, with uh, Dr. Mitro's permission has been recorded, uh, so you can get, get access to this talk at a later point in time. Uh, also, there are academic friends and collaborators across time zones who wanted to listen to this talk but could not make it uh, at this time, so they'll probably have access to this as well. Thank you so much once again, and thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.